I got a view of Seattle from Queen Anne Hill, and I want to show that to you. And as soon as we get it on the screen, a view of Seattle from Queen Anne Hill, which I know we had earlier there. Yes, yes, yes. I love that, Queen Anne Hill. How many of you have been here? I, I don't know about you, but you know, depending on how the picture goes, my eyes always go to the two dominant features, bam, space needle, and right off to Mount Rainier. And then thirdly, I notice the big arena. That's kind of how my take it all in, right? And it's interesting because you look at the whole Seattle skyline from Queen Anne Hill. I love this. This is a sunrise coming up over the city one morning. And uh, you sort of can grasp the, the whole view of just the, you see the lights still on in the back. And you have, you know, what it looks like. You have the, you can describe the skyline, the city. And then you have a hill and then a second hill and then the mountain, right? Uh, skyline, hill, hill, mountain. That's the way it goes. And, and whether you see it in the sunrise or I think the next one even is just a day picture, um, the very next one, yeah, it's the same kind of thing. This is kind of behind some bushes, also from Queen Anne Hill, basic same view, uh, view. And you, could, if I asked you to describe that to someone, you'd be able to sit down, you'd be able to articulate what you see. You'd be able to say, yeah, I see the, the green bushes that are in front, and I can see the arena and the Space Needle and the Seattle skyline, and then I see hill, a hill, and the mountain, right? And that's how it, it looks to you. And you describe that, you can picture the whole view. And to me, the dominant features always seem to be the mountain. I remember I see this view of Seattle from the... Queen Anne Hill, I always, my eyes go right to Mount Rainier, it's sort of big, and the other thing is so contrasting, right, you have the man-made city, and then you have the natural mountain that's out there. What's interesting is how far that mountain really is, how far away it really is, because it is so big, so huge, so vast, that it looks like it's a hill, a hill, and a mountain, right, a hill, a hill, and a mountain, that's, if you were to, to describe that, that's pretty much what you'd say, you'd say city, one hill, two hills, mountain. That's what you would say describing this view. But the truth is, on a map, if you look at a map of the state of Washington, uh, which I have next, actually, uh, this is Mount Rainier, clear down here, and Seattle, uh, Queen Anne Hill, up here. The mountain is more than 40 miles away. If you were to stand there on Queen Anne Hill, you were to walk to Mount Rainier, it's not a hill and a hill. It's more than 40 miles. It would take you days to walk from Queen Anne Hill to Mount Rainier. This is a fantastic word picture of what the Old Testament writers experienced when they could see sort of the future unfold and God would give them glimpses into the king that was coming. They could look at their present times. Go back a slide for me, guys. They could look at their present times and they could note what was going on, whether it was the Babylonians or the Assyrians or what was happening in their society, and they could describe it. But always off on the horizon, they had this sense that there's a king coming. One day this kingdom will emerge. That would be like Mount Rainier in the distance, right? And they would write and they would say, well, we're having this problem. The Assyrians are going to come or the Babylonians are going to come or this, this is the problem in society or there's a locust plague or whatever's going on. There's evil run amok and they would describe what needed to happen in their time. And then there'd be this little shift and they would describe this event that was one day coming when a king and a kingdom would emerge and would dominate all of the earth. And it's funny because when you read the Old Testament, you kind of got to do that shifting of gears and you got to sort of ask when you read any of the Old Testament prophets, is this guy talking about his time and what's going on? Or does he shift gears in the middle of a verse and just start suddenly describing the future kingdom? And then he's back to describing his time and back and forth that goes. But none of them understood the time and the distance that was in between their events in history and the kingdom that they would see. A lot of them thought it was just around the corner, it was just around the corner, but they couldn't see the long eons of time, the hundreds and hundreds of year gap between where they stood in history and the king that would come and the kingdom that would emerge in the same way that you look at there and it's like, it's a hill and a hill and the mountain. That's it. That's what I see. That's what's going to happen. You don't know that it's 40 miles away. And there's vast amounts of land and, and terrain and features and rivers and things that have to be crossed to get there. You can't see that from where you stand. The Old Testament writers couldn't see the vast amounts of time that were going to happen before king would come. Earlier in the service, we had a scripture read from Mark chapter 1. And if you've got a Bible, turn it up. If you don't have a Bible, we got them laying around. we got a few ones here, and the ushers have some at the back. Just hold up your hand really quick if you want to grab a Bible and follow along, because we're going to start tackling this passage of Mark chapter 1 when Jesus emerges on the scene. If you're using one of our Bibles, one of these brown ones here, it's page 743. So if anybody needs one, just raise your hand. The readers will get you one, no problem. Or you can just grab one off of the, off of the table or the even the stage here. And in Mark chapter 1, we heard it read earlier, but I'll repeat it again. Mark chapter 1, verse 1, page 743. It says the beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And then 
Mark writes this, It is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John came baptizing in the desert region. Real interesting, right there, right off the top, you kind of have this fascinating um, beginning where it's like he says, here's what's happening. The king's about to emerge, and it fits with all of history, what the prophets had foretold. All this time in the Old Testament, the prophets had foretold there was one day a kingdom coming and a king that was going to come. And actually, when you start reading the Old Testament, it dates all the way back to really the fall with Adam and Eve. From the very beginning, when there was the fall, there was stuff that God said to Adam about what his life would be like. There was stuff he said to Eve. And he turns to the snake, Satan, and he said something to Satan. He said, one day, the seed of the woman will come. And when the seed of the woman, some offspring would come out of the woman, some, when the seed of the woman comes, you will bruise his heel, but he's going to crush your head. You will do damage to him, but he will ultimately be the one who kills you, Satan, for what you have done. From the very beginning, this prophecy had gone forth from God that this was going to transpire, the seed of the woman, and it begins to emerge more and more. Abraham would come, and God would tell Abraham that through you, all the nations of the world will be blessed. Through you and your seed, through your generation, it's going to come. So he defined it even further. Moses, when he comes along, he finally has this prophetic thing he says to the people. He says, um, that one day God will raise up a prophet like me from amongst you, but he'll be even greater than Moses. He has said that. And then David would come, and he would sit on the throne, and God would tell David, one day, one of your sons will sit on the throne forever and ever and ever. Your, the scepter will not depart from your family. Your generation will have it. So it would keep emerging more, and then the Psalms would emerge, and they would be full of these messianic prophecies of the kingdom that was coming and the king who would, who would emerge. And Isaiah... Isaiah would come, the prophet, about 700 years before Jesus, and he would come on the scene in the northern kingdom of Israel, and he would write vast amounts of stuff, and God would give him glimpses into the king and the kingdom that was coming. And he would write all kinds of phenomenal stuff. Through Isaiah, we would learn that when the king comes, creation itself will be restored. Mankind and creation will come back to living in peace with each other, and there won't be this sort of hostility with the world and creation that man seems to always be fighting nature and subduing it destroying it and corrupting it and figuring out a way to live in harmony with it is a problem we have. And we, would, we would learn that when the king comes, he'll restore it. The animal kingdom, when he comes, will actually reemerge back to the way it was at the created order. The wolf will lie down with the lamb. The little boy will lead the bear. He'll be able to play by the viper's den and not get harmed. The glory of the Lord will fill the earth when the king comes. Isaiah would tell us there'd be peace on all the earth, absolute peace. There won't be violence anymore. And so we would learn when the king comes, you can start to see this this vision emerging all over and over. The king will come and he will establish a kingdom. And this is what the kingdom will be like. And then other prophets would write. Daniel would write about the glory of the God who would come. Zechariah would tell us that nations will bow down before this king and his kingdom. All the nations of the earth will follow him. And Micah would tell us he would be born in Bethlehem. And all of these prophecies would emerge. And all the time the Jewish people were waiting for the day when he came. And it would look like a hill and a hill and then the kingdom. And yet there was all this time between that they could not see. It's just a hill and a hill and a kingdom, right? But all this space between, because they couldn't see how big and vast and huge the kingdom really was. And even though in their prophetic mind, it's right there on the horizon. I can see it right there on the horizon. The truth was, in the history of the world as it unfolded, it was a long way out there. And they would watch while their society would split into two, a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. And then they would watch while the northern kingdom went completely wicked and it would be utterly wiped out in 722 B.C., and they would watch while the, the smaller kingdom of the, the southern woman, it would get wiped out in 586 B.C. And then a small remnant would return. And then they would go back from their captivity and slavery of Babylon. They would go back and they would rebuild this broken, uh, wiped out city that they had of Jerusalem. And then they would fall into what's known as 400 years of silence. Which meant that for the next 400 years, God stopped sending prophets. God stopped sending the guys who would write the books. For 400 years, it's sort of like God went quiet. There was a little brief blurb in history when the Maccabeans took over and they ran Jerusalem and they reestablished a kingdom, but they weren't from the line of David, so they weren't going to be the real thing, and everybody kind of knew that. But God did some cool stuff in there. And during that time, there was this little brief blurb of the Jewish people rising up and trying to establish the kingdom, but it, it didn't work, and they fell. And of course, then history would unfold, and Alexander the Great would arise, and the Romans would arise, and history would march on. But for 400 years, no prophets would speak. No, no prophets would write. No Bible books would be written. It just went quiet. And now Rome ruled the world, the known Mediterranean world. 
Only one mighty civilization could stand against Rome. That was the Parthians. They were out there, the remnants of the old Persian Empire. That was it. Otherwise, they had destroyed everybody in North Africa and all across Europe, clear up into Great Britain. Rome ruled the world. And God was quiet. And in the middle of that quietness, when Rome went from a republic to an empire with the Caesar, comes this voice crying in the wilderness. It's God starts. And it's the voice of one crying in the wilderness. It is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare the way. A voice of one calling in the desert. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight paths for him. It's interesting because he says it's from Isaiah the prophet, but when you go back and look at him, it's actually uh, Isaiah that speaks a little bit, and some of that's from Malachi, which to the Jewish mind wasn't a big deal because they grouped the Bible, and we still group it this way. Uh, you ever wonder why the Bible's not alphabetical? It drives you nuts, right? I should look up Jonah. It should be J for Jonah, right? I should look at A, B, C, D. I should do it alphabetically, but it's never arranged that way. It's arranged with the history books first, and then there's all of those in order, and then you have the wisdom literature and the poetry, you know, the Psalms and the Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, and then there's the prophets, and the most uh, prolific prophet was Isaiah. He would write the most. So all the prophets would be grouped under Isaiah. So when they said, when a Jewish person said, as it says in Isaiah, what they meant was, as it says in that section of the Torah, and that section of the law, of the prophetic law. So they would quote from actual Isaiah, but they might pull a quote up from Malachi, and to them it's no big deal to call it all Isaiah because it was in that section of the Bible. And he says, as it says in Isaiah, and it's funny, go back and look at it. Isaiah, who would be 700 years earlier, he's actually quoting Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, page 539 in those brown Bibles. And this is what it says in Isaiah 40, verse 3. It says, a voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord. Make a straight path in the wilderness, a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level. The rugged places a plain, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all mankind together will see it, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. That's the actual full verse, where here in Mark, he just quotes a little bit of that full verse. And then the second part of that Mark verse is interesting, because it doesn't come from Isaiah, it comes from Malachi. Malachi is the very last book of the, of the Old Testament. It's just before the Gospel of Matthew. And in Malachi, which is page 713 on those brown Bibles you're looking at, um, it's interesting because in Malachi chapter 3, this is what the actual quote is. In chapter 3, verse 3, it says, uh, let me see if I can find it right here. Um, chapter 3, verse 1. Let's do that. He says, See, I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. So his last words were just before the king comes that they could see. He'll send a messenger out just before the king arrives. And then the very last thing said in the Old Testament, in Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament, the very last thing said in verse uh, 5 of chapter 4, he says, See, I will send you the prophet Elijah before the great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. Or else I will come and strike the land with a Poof, Old Testament ends. 400 silent years, and God awakens with John the Baptist quoting these passages. The messenger is emerging. The messenger is coming out. And it's interesting because he starts with the whole idea that there's a voice of one crying in the wilderness. And what he's crying out is, make straight paths. Make the paths straight. And it's kind of wild because in those days, what would happen if a king was traveling through his territory, his domain, he would often send envoys out in front. And he would say, you go days in advance. Go to the, where I'm going to be traveling and inform all the people that I'm coming through my kingdom. So they will prepare the whole place for me. They'll know the king is coming, which meant very typically that the people would literally get out and they would rebuild the roads that they had let fall into disrepair. They would rebuild the bridges that they had let fall into disrepair because the king had been collecting taxes and he had been dispersing the taxes to his domain to say, fix this stuff. So when the king says, I'm coming, you better show me you spent the money right. And so they would realize, oh, you know, the stuff that went into our pockets and we lined our pockets, we got to get out and we got to fix this problem. And so they'd rebuild the roads, they'd rebuild the bridges, they would fix the rest stations, they would prepare the food, they would start gathering everything they need, because they knew when the king comes, it's a big feast. And so here's happened, the king is coming, and God's sending a messenger saying, let everybody know that they'd better be prepared, that the king is finally now coming. John the Baptist emerges on the scene as this messenger figure. He's no ordinary guy, because, I mean, obviously his birth is announced by angels, we know that in Luke, and Jesus knew him in the womb when Jesus was just still an embryo in the womb. Uh, pregnant um, Mary meets her cousin, pregnant Elizabeth. Elizabeth has John the Baptist in her belly, and 
Mary has Jesus and hers, and the, the two babies know each other in the womb. So something special is going on there. Um, we know he's some kind of cousin to Jesus. Somehow he's related to Jesus. We know through the other gospel writers, he's kind of a wild-looking guy. He wears coarse camel hair, leather belt, wild, hairy guy, lived in the desert eating wild honey and locusts. And so he doesn't come on the scene as a nice, refined, dignified fellow. He comes on the scene as this wild messenger descending out of the mountain. Some think he was what would be called an Essene. They were the ones who actually preserved the Dead Sea Scrolls. This group of monks that would kind of remove themselves from society, live in caves out in the Judean wilderness. And when the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, it was thanks to the Essenes. So some think that John the Baptist was an Essene. He lived his whole life in these monasteries, studying scripture and that sort of thing. And when he emerges on the scene as the messenger, he doesn't come with, you know, three-piece suit, and nice shoes, and gold jewelry. He comes as a wild man from the wilderness calling people back to God and saying, the king is coming, and be prepared for this. And it's interesting because we go to Mark chapter 1, and the story will go on. It tells us what John's message was. It says, so John came baptizing in the desert region and preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin. And the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. And then it describes what John looks like. This is kind of wild and weird because, quite frankly, it wasn't typical of the Jewish people of that time to get baptized. They had ritualistic baths that they would carve out in the rock and they would pour with water. They called them mikvahs. And it would be customary that you would take a mikvah bath before a certain ritual would take place. Or maybe a high holy holiday of Passover. You would take a cleansing, ritualistic, purified kind of bath. It would make you clean before God so you could go to the temple or you could perform a sacrifice or something. But the idea of a true baptism that wasn't really the way the Jewish people thought. Baptism was reserved for the Gentiles who converted to Judaism. And the idea would be that from your Gentile pagan upbringing and your false notions of God, you would go into one of these mikvah baths and you would be completely submerged and dunked and you would come up as a ritualistic cleansing of all your past and you would emerge as something new. It was a bit symbolic of death and life. You would die and be buried in the water. You would come up as a new person, recreated. And so the idea was Gentiles get baptized. They're the ones who are coming out of that dark, evil, pagan, godless path. And they're the ones who need baptism. We might just need a little bit of ritualistic mikvah baths now and then, but we don't need baptism. So when John emerges on the scene and he's telling the Jewish people, you need to be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. It's a crazy message. It's basically telling them, you think you got it, but you don't. You think you're in, but you're not. You think because you've read the books that you're somehow special. You think because you were circumcised in the covenant of Abraham that you're automatically in. But what he's doing is he's shifting gears and saying you don't get in through the group or your ethnic heritage or because you've read the book. You get in because you personally have wrestled with your sin and unrighteousness before God. And when you've dealt with that and you've understood that's where you stand, you personally make a conviction with your conviction, make a commitment to say I've got to live differently and be different. To the Jewish people, it's like, well, yeah, I thought I was in because like, I'm a Jew and uh, I'm under Abraham, right? And so John the Baptist coming on the scene saying, not good enough, you need something else, is weird words to them. And yet, it must resonate in their heart. Something hits a chord, something strikes them as truthful, something makes it right because they come out in droves to be baptized by John. And I think what had happened is a whole bunch of them had come out at this time in history realizing we're under Roman occupation. We're an oppressed people group living under the boot of a militaristic government that actually thinks nothing of stomping us out and killing us, that uses execution and, and uh, uh, slaughtering people and, and, and whatnot to, to maintain their peace. We don't have a king. We don't have a kingdom. And what they had turned to was the religious order of the day to save them. And everybody knew in that time the religious order of the day is corrupt. The temple system's corrupt. It doesn't work anymore. It's all about money making. We go down there with our sacrificial lamb. My lamb I bring down to the temple is never good enough and the priest finds a reason to reject it and makes me buy one of his own at three times the price. That's how the system worked. You weren't allowed to bring Roman money into the Jewish temple because it would desecrate the temple. So you had to exchange all your coins out in front of the temple. You had to bring your Roman coins. You'd have to bring them for an exchange and you'd have to get Jewish coins. And of course, they would always cheat you on the exchange. And you knew that, well, they're doing that because that way they make more money. And then I could go into the temple and I could give my tithe by the currency exchange. See, that's how it had to work. You'd bring your tithe in Roman coins, exchange it for Jewish temple coins at a cheated rate, and now you could pay your tithe. 
And it was just this corrupt system, and they knew it. And what had happened is the people had gotten to the place in their own life when they said, I don't trust the system anymore. I don't trust them anymore. Something's missing. They're supposed to be teaching us about God, but it's just a money-making racket. They're supposed to be helping me encounter God and teaching me the scriptures. I'm supposed to be learning more about who I am in relationship with God, but I don't trust them anymore. It's all shot. And something's wrong with me, and something's wrong in the culture, and something's wrong in society. Something greater is wrong. God isn't moving. And so when John the Baptist comes on the scene and says, you as an individual need to be baptized for the repentance of sins, everybody goes out there saying, maybe that's what's missing. Maybe it's not trusting the group anymore, or the institution, or the culture. Maybe what I need to trust is in something else, like maybe it's about me and God. And by the, in droves they come out. I think it's interesting because he comes out and he's preaching a repentance. The word literally means to turn around. So it means to be going a certain direction, and the Greek word repent actually means to stop going this direction, and not just stop, but literally to turn around and go the opposite direction. That's what the word literally means. In America, we don't like repentance. We've decided to go, we've decided to throw that away. In the last 20, 30 years, we don't do repentance. Churches just preach God loves you. Good enough. Christ died on the cross for your sins. Good enough. We've stopped preaching. What John was preaching is, hey, there needs to be a change, a transformative change in your life at some point. That's what you should be looking for. And if you're not experiencing a transformative change, something's missing. And, you know, we don't like the idea of repentance because repentance for Americans means I have to actually accept that I've screwed up and I have to confess that and I've got to say that. We don't like doing that. We're much better at saying, I know I'm screwed up, but it's someone else's fault. It's my parents' fault. It's my school's fault. It's my friend's fault. It's my boss's fault. We're much better at explaining why we're screwed up because someone else did something to us and made us screwed up. Therefore, we're sort of off the hook to own our own sins. Or we fall into, everybody else does it anyway, right? So everybody else is doing this. So we don't own our sins because if there's enough sin in society, I'm not, my sin's not unusual. It's not bizarre. If there's enough greed, if there's enough anger, if there's enough lust, if there's enough jealousy... If there's enough rage, I don't have to own mine because everybody's got it. We say, oh, I'm only human. Then God comes on the scene and he says, yeah, but I'm kind of looking for something more special. I'm looking for something deeper. I'm looking for people who aren't just looking at the whole group and saying, well, I'm like one of them. God's saying, I'm looking for people who are hungry for God. who are saying, I can sense something's wrong in society. I can sense something's wrong in the religious institution. I can sense something's wrong in the group. I can sense something's wrong in the culture and I'm wrestling with all of this, and I don't quite know where to go, and I, I can even sense something's wrong in myself because I don't feel peace and joy just going through life. And that restlessness inside is the thing God's looking for. He's saying, that's what I want. God's looking for that. And he has the people coming out. John the Baptist has them coming out. They're being baptized. There's this repentance piece which says, whatever I've been doing in life, the direction I'm going, it's not enough just to stop going that direction. I've got to turn and go the opposite direction. There actually needs to be maybe some action step on my part that helps in the transformation process. It's not just that I stop being a sinner or whatever. It's that I've got to become something new. Uh, on the wall, as you walk out the doors, you will see the beginning of a quote. It says, love, mercy, do justice, over the archway. And the full quote is going to be emerged. Actually, that's kind of a biblical phrase, love, mercy, do justice. Under love, mercy, the letters are going to say, meet the need. Meet the need. A lot of us, you know, what we think, you know how we take care of meeting needs in society now? When there's poor, when there's downcast, when there's hungry, when there's broken people, when there's whatever. You know how we meet the need? I'll like it on Facebook. Click. There, I've done my part, right? That's what we think. We think, oh, I've done that. We did that. It wasn't very long ago. We did that with all those girls that got captured in, uh, by, by uh, what is the Boko Haram, right? What did, what did America actually do to save those girls from the brutal captivity and rape that they were going to experience? Oh, well, we liked it on Facebook. We all said, bring back our girls on Facebook. You know how many girls that that campaign brought back? Zero. You know how many more girls were abducted after that campaign? Hundreds more. Liking it on Facebook is worthless. It doesn't do anything. It doesn't transform anything. A change needs to happen where action is taken. We think that because I like something on Facebook, that's my statement. That's good enough. If I've liked it online, I've done something. It's like, ah, not really. Recent studies actually show that the people who like stuff on Facebook about social justice and poverty issues are the least likely to volunteer or donate. The more likely you are to like stuff on Facebook, they've done studies now that says the more likely that you are the person who will actually not do anything about whatever cause you're liking on Facebook, whether it's sex trafficking or whatever, racism or whatever, least likely to do something. So it's like, okay, we're being called out. 
right, as a society. We're being called out. We think we're doing something, and we're not. We think we're making a difference, and we're not. And I think God's calling us out and saying, yeah, I'm looking for something a little different. Something that's more of an action step than liking it on Facebook. Okay? And we come down to this idea that God's saying, if you turn and go a different direction, you mean some action needs to happen. So love mercy is meet the need. And underneath it says do justice. The words that will follow under that are solve the problem. Love mercy is meet the need. And do justice is solve the problem. Take action. Do something that says something's broken here. The way we like to phrase it, and within, I've been to many of our conference meetings in the Evangelical Covenant, and the way we like to phrase it, because we're super involved in all kinds of racial reconciliation and sex trafficking issues and all that as a denomination, we got hospitals in the Congo, the poorest nation in the world, huge mission work, lots of stuff going on with um, wherever there's a tsunami or a tidal wave or an earthquake or a tornado, we're on the ground. We're there. Our guys are there. And uh, the way that they like to phrase it is, if you live by the side of a river, and day after day you see someone float down the river and you jump in and rescue them, because they're floating down the river and they need to be safe. If you jump in the river and you drag them to safety to shore, that's compassion. That's loving mercy. But if you do this day after day, and one day you say, I want to go upriver and see why people are falling in the river to begin with, now you're doing justice. And when you get upriver and you discover it's because a bridge is out and people walking across are trying to, are falling off of this rickety old bridge and you decide to repair the bridge, that's doing justice. So, Rescuing the person out of the river is good. It needs to be done. But if day after day you keep seeing people do that, you need to do something about it. That's, that is going from loving mercy to doing justice. God was calling the people in that day to that same kind of thing. Love and mercy, do injustice. And it's interesting because he says, you know, the, the people are going out and they were accepting a baptism of repentance. And the whole concept of repentance, what was kind of falling on there is this idea that people were aware that they were carrying in their lives guilt and shame. And whatever was happening in the society, whatever was happening with the sacrificial system, whatever was happening, they were like, a lot of things can go down, but I can't get rid of my own guilt, and I can't get rid of my own shame. This last week, I encountered that in some situations uh, with, a, with a couple of people where I was trying to talk to and counsel and deal with, and I realized that their sense of, of self-worth and shame was so, so broken, so wounded, so shattered, they could not actually emerge and have just a healthy conversation. Shame was the dominant thing. And actually, shame has only recently been kind of studied. It was only about the 1980s that psychologists and psychoanalysts started really looking at shame. For a long time, shame was considered rather productive in society. And it was because it would kind of harness people's wild impulses and that people wouldn't do things based on shame. But then, you know, some people just forego, would forego shame altogether and others would be wrapped in so much shame they couldn't function. And it's interesting because Thomas Shep, who's a professor emeritus at UCSB, He's the author of numerous books on psychological topics and the social order. He was one of the pioneer researchers in the 80s on shame. And he would say, normal shame is just like breathing air. It's necessary. Personalities and civilizations coexist, even thrive with normal shame. But unacknowledged shame is a pathogen, and it kills. Leon Wormster, a Baltimore psychologist, also a shame pioneer, wrote in his book, The Mask of Shame, as with any problem that is severely repressed and unresolved, Shame forces us in ways that are outside our control to behave destructively to ourselves and to others. If you run from shame, you may successfully avoid the humiliation you fear, but you constantly sense this anxiety within yourself, and you know you cannot escape it. It follows you like a shadow. One of the important results of such therapeutic adjustments is the creation of a safe haven where the patient is able to speak the terrible truths he or she harbors about himself or herself. Putting shame into words appears to be a critical first step in feeling oneself or freeing oneself of its damning logic. Psychology Today published an article by Mary Lamy, a PhD, and she said, as a self-conscious emotion, shame informs you of an internal state of inadequacy, unworthiness, dishonor, or regret about which others may or may not be aware. Another person, circumstance, or situation can trigger shame in you, but so can a failure to meet your own ideals or standards, whether or not they're a perfectionist. Given that shame can lead you to feel as though your whole self is flawed, bad, or subject to exclusion, it makes you want to withdraw or hide yourself, so it is no wonder that shame lurks behind addictions that seek to mask its impact. Shame is often confused with guilt, an emotion you might experience as a result of wrongdoing, about which you might feel remorseful and wish to make amends, where you will likely have an urge to admit guilt or talk with others about a situation that left you with guilty feelings. 
it is much less likely that you will broadcast your shame. In fact, you will most likely conceal what you feel because shame does not make a distinction between an action and the self. Therefore, with shame, bad behavior is not separate from a bad self as it is with guilt. When John the Baptist comes on the scene and he's telling people, repent, receive this baptism, he could see something coming. He could see it on the horizon. He was on the front edge of the kingdom was about to emerge. The king was about to come and he knew something. He knew the king was going to come and he was going to take your guilt and he was going to take it on himself and relieve any penalty that you might experience from evil and wrongdoing that had happened. And he was going to exchange shame for righteousness and glory. This is what Jesus was going to do. And John the Baptist could see it. Granted, he'd be a little iffy and confused himself because he couldn't see the whole picture. Only Jesus knew the whole picture. And the disciples wouldn't see it until after the resurrection. But it's interesting because he comes on the scene. And when he says this, he knows that a king is coming after me. And I can baptize you with water, but he'll baptize you with fire. I'm not even fit to untie this king's sandals. That's how incredible he's going to be when he comes. And what's weird is like it's his cousin. Right? I don't think John the Baptist knows for sure that it's his cousin Jesus. The day that Jesus comes to get water baptized, which is the next section of the chapter we'll do a week from now, he suddenly realizes, oh, you are the one I've been preaching. I could only see what the Holy Spirit showed me. I couldn't see the whole picture, but now I know it's you. And he, even in his short, brief life after that, he'll get confused, wondering what it is. But here's what Jesus would come to do. When the pure and holy and perfect righteous king came and died on the cross, he was actually not like losing to the powers that be. He wasn't losing to the government. He wasn't losing to the, the religious order. He was actually a willing sacrifice because he was saying, here's the problem. All of the earth is riddled with guilt. All of the earth is bound up in this evil that has happened. And all of the earth, every human being who has ever walked the planet before and since Jesus is deserving of this punishment, this guilt needs to be punished. And Jesus would take the punishment. When he dies on the cross, he dies on the cross in the place of every human being who would ever live. You and me, everybody in his time, everybody who had died even before him, and everybody who would live after him. And he takes this punishment. And so there's no guilt left to be punished. And then he promises for people who put their faith in me, is I, will ex I will exchange the shame you feel about yourself and your life and what you've done. I will exchange it with my glory. I'll put my spirit inside of you. And you will no longer be who you think you are. You will be who I say you are, the child of the true and living God. I find it interesting because part of the stuff I wrestle with is when God had said, make straight paths. Bring down every hill, raise up every valley, make the roads that are crooked straight. It's like, it's kind of weird because I always wrestle with, God, what do we need to do? Because I know there's nothing we can do to be, to exchange this guilt and shame for his glory and his peace and his covering. There's nothing we can do in that. And yet sometimes I have sensed, and I know this to be true, that when we really want God to completely move in our lives, there needs to be a bigger change. And it's like talking to an alcoholic. And when you talk to an alcoholic and if they would just say, well, I've just prayed that God would heal me, and he hasn't, so here I am, I'm stuck. I think every single one of us in the room would say, uh, that's a dumb, because, see, there's a path that alcoholics have all seem, seem to try to get out of being an alcoholic, and there's a journey that needs to be done on the part of the person trapped in that. And if you're not willing to do some kind of journey, then you're not willing to make your path straight. You're not willing to bring down every hill and raise up every valley is the way that the Bible would phrase it. Then you're not going to experience what God wants to give you. And I always wrestle with this kind of idea of, of, I know God gives us this grace for free. I know he gives us this salvation for free. But there's times when he wants us to participate with him in the healing process of the guilt and the shame. And the participation often requires courage on our part. Often requires something we got to do. Often requires us to step forward and become something. Or take an action. And when we do, then we start sensing, oh, this is how God's moving. The king is coming into my life. And I made some paths straight. I lowered some hills. I raised some valleys. And now I sense him coming into my life. And there's a change. And he's looking for that participation. As we conclude the service, I want the worship team to kind of gather. i got some interesting, you know, they've got to go back and grab the kids and get them coming up. But the good news is what the gospel means, literally means good news. It's still good news. It's still the sense that God's saying to all of us, I want to exchange my, your shame for my righteousness. He's saying that. To you. I want to give you what my perception is. I want to put my Holy Spirit inside you and live inside you and, and make you who I want you to be. And I'll see you through my eyes. And when God the Father looks at us, he sees us through his eyes. And he says, I'll take the guilt you may feel. Come on up, you guys. Um, and it's been paid for. There's nothing left for you to do. You can't earn your own salvation. But I will say that there are times when God says, now, if you want the full healing of what I have for you, there's a part that 
that you do need an action on, on your step. And some of you, it may be an action, it may be like, you know, it's a good time for me to see a financial counselor about my, my life is a mess. Maybe it's a good time for me to talk to a counselor about just kind of the, the depression I'm going through. Maybe it's time for me to figure out if my depression's chemical and I need to do something about that. Or maybe it's something about, you know, I've lived my whole life bound up in shame, but I'm not willing to talk to anyone about it. Maybe God just says, you need to find a friend that you sit down with and take your friendship to a new level and start to tell your true story. Start to say, this is how I really think. This is how I really feel. Begin to tell your true story to a trusted friend. And then your friendship will go deeper to a higher level. Then you'll start to sense God moving and doing fresh ways. And this next song, the lyrics for it, I think we've, we've got them up here. It's about Jesus who breaks the power of sin and darkness. His love is mighty and so much stronger. And yeah, I think as we sing just this last verse, and it's only a chorus, verse and a chorus of this, this is what Jesus wants to do with all of us. He wants to break the power of sin and darkness that's in our lives, secretly hiding. And he wants to take us and exchange it for his love, which is so much more mighty. And for some of us, it'll just be, wham, he'll do it with a prayer. He does do that. But for some of us, he'll say, I want you to take a couple steps and take a couple actions. I want you to step out and encourage. Tell a friend, talk to someone. I want you to begin to read my words in my book. I'll tell you what I've said, and I'll, I'll give you new life and understanding. I'll reform the way you perceive the universe. And whatever it is, it's going to be unique to each of us. It's not going to be one size fits all. Because your life and your journey is yours. So as we sing this, let's let this just this last brief course this be our admission or our um, acceptance of saying this, these words, Jesus, as we sing them, are coming from my heart. I'm saying, yeah, Lord, you break the power of sin and darkness in and you bring your love to me. And if there is something you want me to do, Lord, just show me what that is. And give me the courage to do it. Would you stand with us? This is the blessing I give these people today. That we sense with great joy and peace what it's like to exchange our shame and guilt for your glory and your righteousness. And it's something deep in our souls that we all feel we all experience. And Lord, for those of us that you want to take bigger steps of courage and strength to make more dramatic change in our lives, give us the courage to do it. And also give us the wisdom to know what to do. And may you reveal that through the power of your Holy Spirit to each of us individually. This is our prayer in your holy name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Thank you guys for coming. We'll see you next week.